Well, it's snowing in Montreal, but 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 good otherwise. <laughs> What? Sorry, I missed that. Somebody said recording's in progress. Yeah, well, it's 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 currently snowing in Montreal at the end of April, so I'm I'm uh, a little oh uh, thrown off by you know. Yesterday it was twenty degrees, and today I've got snow. So, <laughs> okay, well that's that, that's because you live in a really weird part of the country. You know, this is strange. There are some places like New York always used to sort of freak me out a bit because it would have the same thing. I was there in at the end of April, and yeah. it snowed one day. The whole city cage was standstill. That's and the next York. day, there was a foot of snow, and the next day it melted and it all just went away, and everybody we got back to more. It was very odd. It was very odd. Um, let's, let's just get right into this. We are, of course, okay. uh, speaking with uh, John of uh, Dire Straits. My Life in Dire Straits, the book, is available now. And uh, Which, by the way, uh, doesn't that sound better than saying, it's John the Banker, right? <laughs> well... <laughs> Uh, we have to, sometimes we have to try all sorts of things in life before we discover what we really want to do. But, well, let me ask you about that. Uh, early on in the in in the book, you you talk about your father and you talk about you know you sort of how you got to be in a musical band. You did the record store, you did all that stuff. But mm -hmm. you do mention that you could have been a banker like your father. Um, was he supportive of your musical endeavors, or was he one of those? you know, staunch, old school, like, Ugh, don't go doing that hippie stuff, my son. Be be serious in life. Well, it's an interesting question because I've actually thought about this quite a lot. I didn't, he didn't really uh, want me to follow him into the, into the banking situation uh, because I don't think he particularly enjoyed it himself. It was more pressure from my mother to get me out of the house and say, for God's sake, go and do something. And uh, the local bank needed some some uh, victims, so <laughs> I went in there for a, a couple of months, and and that sort of definitely cured me of ever wanting to go into banking. Uh, and you know, I tried a few other things because you know, in those days, you had to go and get some money, and I mm -hmm. so I ended up working for a timber firm for three years, and uh, you know, just mucking about with bits of wood and things, and. Um, but music was always this sort of thing nagging in the background. I suppose for a lot of people, you never really think that you're going to do anything with music until suddenly you find yourself doing something with it. Yeah. And I mean, the, th the thing about the book, which I tried to get across, is that everybody's life has different things happening in it. And one thing you do triggers another thing, which triggers another thing. Uh, so that's how you make your life. And so every decision I made made me end up in that council flat in South London meeting the Knopfler brothers. Right. That, and I wouldn't have got there if I hadn't done all the other things before that. Do you see what I'm saying? So I think yep. if, if anybody looks at their life, they would probably see it in a similar kind of way. Oh, this is how I got there. You know, well, I mean, what, how did you get where you got, for instance? I mean... Obviously, you, you like music or you like talking to people, maybe a bit of I both. do. And, and uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you real quick how I got here. Uh, back in 1980, when I was 11 years old, I looked on the back of a KISS record and I saw the contact information for O'Coin Management. So I phoned it and I said, could I set up an interview with KISS? And they went, yes, of course. And <laughs> And my mom drove me down to New York City to the offices of uh, Glickman and Marx, and we went in and we interviewed Gene Simmons with no makeup on. And that story sort of lived in infamy, and here we are all these years later, and I'm still interviewing people. So it, it was just me yeah. sort of taking a shot in the dark. Yeah, and if they'd said no, you'd have gone, oh, well, maybe I'll try somewhere else. And then something else would have happened. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, it, it's remarkable how it happens. It's... You have to take a few risks in life, I think. I, 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 you and do. I've always been a bit like that. I'm still taking risks now, you know, uh, still going out and playing music. That's a bit of a risk in, in this. Well, in, this I, in fact, let, let me ask you about risk. And I don't mean to cut you off, but you do in the book talk about uh, taking the risk about doing a solo album. And then, of course, we, we have this book, which, you know, it's taking a risk because you're known as being a musician, not a writer, or not yeah. a not a book writer, I should say. Yeah, exactly, but at yeah. the end of the book, you say, I have never properly understood where that impulse comes from, this urgency to connect with people. Um, I'll start with that. 
Talk to me about that urgency to connect with people because you, you had it. You were on the stages. You were all over the world, Sydney, Japan, Montreal. Talk to me about that need to connect with people. Well, I think some people um, feel that need. I don't quite, I, as I said, I don't really know quite where it comes from, but, but I love the element of communication, which art, and I, when I say art, I'm talking about music, painting, mm -hmm. theater, poetry, whatever. I'm always, I've been intrigued by that element, which is not kind of obvious, if you like. So, I mean, abstract art, for instance, is a whole different thing, but that, that's why the way I paint, so I communicate in that kind of way. Right. It, it's trying to actually get across something which is inside you, which you need a sort of medium for. And music does that for me. So when I write, I'm writing about things that kind of either annoy me or fascinate me or... Um, I'm intrigued by, you know, like, a, a, you know, a love affair or, or, a, or, a, you know, some sort of history situation or whatever. And so it's really just communicating how you feel about the world in a way. And I think that's, I think that's what makes most musicians and artists want to stand in front of a load of people and, and, uh, you know, sort of attempt to entertain them. And thankfully, we managed to do that quite successfully so um not everybody does i mean the thing is the amount of people who actually sort of are successful in music when you consider how many people want to be is very small yeah and um and no, I say it's, it's probably less than one percent i mean it's it's, it's ridiculously yes. small it's like it's like painters i know so many painters who never sell any paintings. They might sell one painting a year or two paintings a year. Well, you can't live off that. No. You really can't. And in fact, if I turned out to be a painter, I wouldn't be talking to you now. I'd I'd, I'd be scratching around in some, you know, back <laughs> room, about a basement flat somewhere in Bradford in north of England or something. <laughs> yeah, just know. not in Australia. They won't buy your art. They just, they won't buy your art. No, they bloody well didn't, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was a bit pissed off, actually, because they were some of the best paintings I've ever done. And funny enough, most of those ones I took to Australia, I've actually sold since they came back. They're well, these paintings are well traveled. In fact, actually, one came back to England and then somebody in Australia said, oh, I'd love to see that painting that you had in the Sydney show. And I said, it's back in England. Also, could you send it out? So it's, it's, it's been to Australia twice now. I don't think it's going to come back. So One weird things happen, you know. You just have to be open, really, to what's going on. Um, let me get over to what's going on here. Never told a soul. Uh, yeah. The band is on top of the charts. You're 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 doing huge tours, and you decide I'm going to do a solo album. And in the book, you say, "Listen, when I said that to the record company, they stared at their feet. They didn't want you know. They, they pretended the bass player didn't say that." Um, exactly. Talk to me about that urge and wanting to to get that out there. And you say in the book also, I believe there is music and art in all of us. And and this time you wanted to get it out. You didn't want to just be sort of a tourist on the bus. Um, hmm. Why yeah. why do that? Yeah. Well, I think it's 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 they're taking a risk again. I mean, the band have had four four successful albums by this time, and most people would think it's completely insane for the bass player, as the record company did going off and making a solo record but I had these songs and I had some time on my hands it was the first time really that since 1976 77 that mm -hmm. we'd actually had a break after the love over gold tour when we actually took some time out before we started the brothers in arms thing so I actually had some time on my hands and I bought myself a piano and I thought I'm going to teach myself how to play the piano uh which of course is you know I, I can still play a few chords but I'm, you know I never did really get beyond it. it's a bit like skiing you never really get beyond a certain point but you know I write on the piano and and so I you know I I, I tried to I try to sort of improve in a sense my ability to write songs because living with a great songwriter like Mark you know you you, you learn something right. you learn about structures you learn about chords you learn about phrasing you know and so I thought well I've got these songs and I and I just literally, you know, worked on them with a with a local piano player down in Sussex, you know, where I was living at the time. And somehow or other, thing, the thing emerged, and I thought, well, I'm, I might as well record these. So I just got well, Mark actually came and played on some of the tracks. And, yeah. yeah. And then one thing led to another, and you know, I did another one in, you know, after Brothers in Arms, 
it's it, I, once I got started, I sort of now I'm on my eighth solo album, which <laughs> which is crazy, really. Think about it. But uh, no, I just I love the energy of trying to put those things together. There's something, and 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 if anybody, when you talk to most songwriters, it's a bit like a massive jigsaw puzzle. Right. You know, you have all these ideas, you write things down, little ideas about songs, and then you might put a snippet of music on your iPhone, you're like the, you know. And, and uh, and then and then things start to emerge and and suddenly you've got a song on your hand. You think, how the hell did I get to that particular point? And I don't understand how that works. But thankfully, something comes out of the activity. And and it's a bit like golfers when they when somebody asks a golfer, how did you how did you get so good at what you do? And they say, well, a hell of a lot of practice actually. Oh, oh, is that the way it works? So really, it is. You just have to work at it until it starts to make sense to you, and hopefully, maybe make sense to somebody else. Um, let me just quickly uh, take up on that for a second. In terms of writing, and you and you said you're on your eighth solo album. You know, yeah. when you're in dire straits and you're on MTV and you're on the radio and there's a big tours, there's a pressure. You have to have a single. Write me a single, right? The AOR guy. Write me. A... Now yeah. you're just writing for the love of writing. Talk to me about that difference and that dichotomy, because I can imagine it's it's not the same pressure. It's 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 got to be more enjoyable. Do you know the funny thing is I've never, to be honest, I've never felt any pressure from that. I don't I don't succumb to. I do it for myself. Okay. And you know, and when I go out and play, I play my songs and I play the straight songs and they mix all up together and. It's fine, and um, I, I, my, the musicians I play with, they say, "Can we play some of more of your songs?" Because we actually, which is a great compliment, you know, especially when you're battling against something like Brothers in Arms or Money for Nothing or Romeo and Juliet. I mean, it's a bit of a bit of a high <laughs> level you know, going on here. Yeah, but I, it doesn't it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It's just getting stuff out into the marketplace. And this new album, I've been really pleased with this one. It was done during lockdown. And I've, I've had a, it's, it's the strongest response I've had from anything I've ever done. So it's great to get to 72 years of age wow. and getting some great feedback from people and think, oh, people are, people are actually really liking this, you know, this, this out. And, th and what's happened is they've gone back now and gone, oh, I wonder what else he's done. Wow. And, and, and that's been, a, it's been interesting because there's always a knock, there's a knock back effect. You know, if you have a successful something, oh, who is this guy? Who was the bass player from Dire Straits? Oh, he's not bad. It's, it's, it's all right. It's, it's quite nice to listen to or whatever, you know. Um, it's, it's always a bit of a challenge, but I mean, I, 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 could, I could be completely nuts, but I, I still just enjoy doing it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, nothing matters really in life. You get to a stage where, <laughs> you know, what, yeah. what matters is your health and, you know, hopefully the you know the, some sanity in the world we're very pretty much short of at the moment but anyway we won't go there that, that's fun it's funny because uh somebody this morning was saying oh we, we got to go to this show and we got to get some uh, passes and blah and i went i don't care if i have passes I, I, i'll just go maybe i won't even go i'm just i'm alive it's all good um there's a couple of moments that that sort of uh, define the band or define your career or that you certainly highlighted in the book and first of all it's charlie gillette yeah. Uh, the man who D did he give you a career is that is that overstating it i mean obviously you had the songs and the talent but if it wasn't for him spinning that record sultan no. um again we might not be here today I is that an exaggeration well, i think the simple answer is i don't <clears throat> know to be honest it is actually pronounced uh, um charlie gillett oh gillett uh, well but See, uh, we're in wait. Canada. We, we we buy Gillette razors. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you would have liked a slice of that, I reckon. Yeah. Um, but he was a he was a really uh, interesting man because he he was taking risks every every week by playing music that other people wouldn't play. So he used to play a lot of new bands. So that's <clears> why <throat> I went to him and I, I I made a contact with him earlier with the record shop. So that contact was there. So you see, I wouldn't have known Charlie if I hadn't stuck my neck out and gone to the blooming record shop, which was a complete disaster. Yep. But I met Charlie as a consequence of that. And when we made the demo tape, Mark said to me, don't you know Charlie Gillett? I said, I don't, I don't exactly know Charlie Gillett. I mean, he's a, he's a DJ who helped me with choosing the records in the store. He said, well, 
can you get in contact with him? And I said, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I sort of sent a note to him at the radio station. And I said, do you remember me, the honky, honky tonk records and all the rest of it? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I'm in a band. He went, oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> we got a demo tape. And he said, oh, yeah. And anyway, he played the damn thing on the radio and, and um, you know, things started to happen. So there's, there's another coincidence, you see, which you call it a coincidence, but actually you made the coincidence happen. Well, okay, yeah. then talk to me about that record, uh, that record store, because you you talk in the book about you got Please Please Me from the Beatles as your first uh, single or album, and, yeah. and, and this love of music is fostering, and you read the stories of a lot of people, whether it's Elton John or Ozzy Osbourne or whoever, and they go, man, I had to get a guitar, I had to get a drum, I had to get a thing. And yeah. and you said, I, I got to open a record store. <laughs> uh, well, I'd, I'd already got the guitar. I bought, I bought that when I was 14 years old. I mean, the, the music was speaking to me quite early on, to right. be honest. I mean, Elvis and, and Buddy <clears throat> Holly and Chuck Berry and such like. And and then you start looking back at the early blues people, because that's where it all comes from. Then. But um, yeah, well, records, records were expensive in those days. I mean, it was... It was much more than a week's pocket money. I can tell you to buy a, but to buy a record. So you really saved up. So it was a, it was a piece mm -hmm. of gold in your hands when you went to the record. So you probably remember this. I mean, I absolutely do. Buying, I think buying a piece of vinyl was, was a really exciting moment. And um, so I, I, mean, I yeah. can't guess. Well, it, it was now even. So it sounds crazy. It, it, it was almost like buying a puppy in a pet store. You'd walk by the window and look at it every week and go, "I'm almost there." I'm going to get yeah, that right. Yeah. And, you, you, and then eventually you'd buy it and you go, yes. And yeah, if yeah, the record yeah. was great, you had a great summer. And if the record sucked, you were like, damn it, I should have bought that other yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, but then, you, but then you invite your mates around and you put it on a cheap sort of, the only deck you could afford was something dead cheap in those days. And, and you'd play it to death until the, you know, wore the needle out and stuff. Yep. And it was all scratched and whatever. I mean, they became sort of. I've still got. I've still got loads of the ones I bought when I was wow. fifteen years old. I've still got them. You know, they've still got the price tag on. You know, uh, the folders are coming apart a bit, but you know, so just part of your life, really. And I think these are there are seminal moments. I think in, uh, the thing is with music. What I've discovered it is that for, for a lot of people, music is it's not it's not as important as it is for other people. You know, they might go and do a bit of dance. They go to a disco or they go to a say, disco. That's an old word, isn't it? They go to a <laughs> club or something, you know, and listen to rap music. And, and, and Or they take a few tapes on holiday with them or something. But for someone you know, like you and me, it's kind of, it's not obsession, but it's something that's really part of our lives. And we can't shake it off, really. No. It's kind of important. And it's there every single day. It's not something you just have to go, well, I won't do it. I won't listen to any music today. I mean, when I'm painting oh, my studio, I've got everything. Everything's going on in there. I mean, you know, so you, it, you, it's, it, it's, it's a big part of our lives. But we also have to remember that it's not such a big part of other people's lives. So we're always a bit surprised when people put certain songs at number one in the charts. And you think, what is going on out there? That's really weird. Who's buying that? And then you it's realize, true. of course, that. Everybody has different taste from you, and you've got to sort of, you've got to sort of bear with that, you know. It's it's a great rassembleur, as we say here in in Montreal, because I have a Twitter that has thirty five thousand or thirty six thousand followers, and I just sort of post what I find interesting in music, and and to see that other people find it interesting too is is like, oh, how did yeah. that happen? Um, well, these these are great communication tools now. Everybody has a go at the digital and internet age and all the rest of it. But to me, it's, a, it's all positive. I mean, there's obviously stuff that on it that isn't positive, but generally speaking, sure. it's an incredible communication tool. Yep. And we shouldn't forget that. It gets misused, we know, but generally speaking, it's, a, it's an incredible bit of technology which has joined the world up, shared the world with, we were sharing the world with each other big time now. Some of that's not so good, so, yeah. but I see it as a positive thing most of the time. I, I agree. Uh, um, you know. Another moment in the book that you single out uh, is the Roxy out in uh, California. And of course, a lot of people talk about Wembley and Madison Square Garden and the Forum. and But the Roxy was, for you at that time, like 
reaching the top of the mountain. Um, quickly yeah. talk to me about the importance of being a British band flying over, not to New York, not to Montreal, but to Los Angeles mm -hmm. and being at the Roxy. Yeah. Well, there are just some places in the world which have uh, an incredible history and... Um, you know, the, the Marquee Club in London was one. The Bottom yeah. Line in New York was another. You know, uh, CBGBs. I mean, you know, the, and the Roxy in LA is the same thing. And and the thing is that when we hit America, uh, we hit it at a rather opportune time because I think the album was at number four or something in the single. But every time you went into a city, Stones was on the blooming radio. It was like, oh, my God. So by the time we got to the Roxy, it, it was what you call a seriously hot ticket. So the only people who could get in were people who, you know, knew each other, if you like. The sort of, the glitterati of the music industry. And as I say in the book, there was some, you know, quite a lot of those there. So it was, that was pretty nerve wracking. I've got to tell you, to get into that, somebody sent a limo around for us to take us from the sunset marquee to the first time we've ever been in a limo for god's sake we didn't even know what they looked like and um you know i think we were still living in that council flat in south london i mean you know we would uh, we'd had a little bit of money coming in but we didn't have any time to spend anything at all and, and in fact we we literally were running that tour on our own we i think we had two roadies Jeez. and um a, a tour manager and the four of us and we, we were booking our own flights and helping load the stuff in and out of the venues and stuff. I mean, it was mad, really, to think about it. And then Bob Dylan turns up, you know, and says, hi, you've got a great sound there. <laughs> so thanks, Bob. Hey, it's Bob, a bit, thank you. It's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit rapid, you know, that I, when I, things happened rather quickly. So you, you have to sort of stop yourself a minute and think, hang on a second, something's going on here. And uh, so that was an incredible tour. I mean, I think we did 58 shows in 35 days or something nuts. Wow. Uh, we anyway, can't we, were do young, that. we were young and fit at the time, so that was all right. Yeah, the good old days. Um, uh, I know that we only have about half an hour, so let me just quite quickly get to it, to Brothers in Arms. Uh, uh -huh. And let me start at the at the end of it. You do the tour. It's it's forever and always. You're you're on the road nonstop. I mean, it's it's almost two years, if not more. And and you just you just sort of walk away at the end. You say, eh, I'm kind of done." Um, why was there not a desire to get back and make another album and make another tour and 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 build on the success and say, "Wow, we're we're all over these charts. Let's go make another." You just sort of went, "Meh, that's enough." Well, the, I think after you've had an album of that magnitude, you you sort of need to back off for a bit. Actually, right. I think it's wise to back off for a bit. And I really, as I say in the book, I really thought that was probably, I think we'd reached the zenith at that particular point in time. There was a big tour. The album was just seemed to be everywhere. Um, and don't get me wrong, as I say in the book, we, Mark and I really enjoyed the success side of that. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with success, and especially when it feels right. You know what I mean? I felt good about it. I felt really good about it. But honestly, after that, I just wanted to just <laughs> not do much. And Mark had got other projects on the go. He wanted to go and do different things. And so we sort of said goodbye and, you know, uh, and I thought, well, okay. So I just thought I'll just live a normal bloke for a while, you know, that, and it was great. Right. And I did another solo album and I did Glass in 87. I went to do a few gigs and then we, we did this, uh, the Mandela show, yeah. Nelson Mandela's 70th birthday party. In 80, I always get this date wrong, 88 or 89, I can't remember. I think anyway, it's 88, so, if I remember. Thanks, thank you very much. And um, so we, we, you know, we, had, we did that, and then I thought, well, okay, well, that's great. And uh, then it all went quiet, and then I had lunch with Mark one day, and he said, I've got some songs I think which The Straight should do. And I went, really? I, I thought you and I were just meeting up to have a lunch and drink too much wine. And... Um, so that we ended up going to another record. And, and I think of, and of every street, you know, people say, oh, it's not as good as Brother Numb. You know, it's just, that's just the way people conceive it. I mean, there's some great songs on that record. And in fact, actually, that tour afterwards, we played to two, three times as many people on that, on every street tour that we did on the Brother Numb's tour. Yeah. It was completely bonkers. And that's what really, 
I think the On Every Street tour was the sort of the that that then said definitely for Mark and I, okay, that's definitely enough. That's that enough. is it, that's it. Or else we're gonna we're gonna hurt ourselves. Well, you know, you know it's it, it's interesting because uh, it reminds me of this story. I was talking to Doug uh, Doug Feger of the Knack, oh, yeah. and we were talking about my Sharona, and he says, "Mitch, you don't understand. It it was the golden albatross. It's paid for the house. It's paid for the pool, and everything you see here, <laughs> it paid for it. However, every time we went to record a new song, the record company would say, "That's great. Can you write us another my Sharona?" And mm -hmm. And when you have an album like Brothers in Arms, I can imagine you sort of get that. People go, wow, that's a really great album. Could you do um, yeah. Brothers in Arms again, please? That'd be great. Like, Well, that's why we left five years between the albums. <laughs> so we can slightly forget about Brothers in Arms. <laughs> but you see, with the thing about Brothers, I mean, people forget that the first four albums had already done very well. You know, Love of the Gold yep. freaked the record company out, as I say in the book, because I said, there's only five songs on this record. There's no single on it. And we went, no, yeah, sorry about that. And anyway, <laughs> Oops. Some, somebody managed to make a, a five minute version of Telegraph Road. And I didn't even bother to listen to it. I just said, please don't play that. <laughs> because they wanted some, they wanted to, they, as you sat right, really said earlier on, they want singles because that's the way the system works. But in fact, I mean, you know, Led Zeppelin didn't put any singles out. Okay, you say Stairway to Heaven was a single, but they just made albums, yep. you know. And, hey, look, uh, Black Sabbath. Third... Black Sabbath had two singles on the Billboard Hot 100, and yet here they are 50 years later. Yeah. Goes to show you about singles. Um, yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, I want my MTV, that, that line from that song, that video was everything i mean i remember watching it going wow look at that animation this is fantastic uh how important was mtv to what you did because it was a new medium but mm. it became the medium and it, it you sort of were mm. one of the first darlings of that medium i think it's just a, it's just a, it was just a coincidence to be perfectly honest i mean mark was living for a bit in new york and and, and the idea of the song came from this this store where he was he was looking at white goods for the for his house in 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 um in New York and and MTV was all over the you know mm -hmm. all over the wall and he was just jotting down what these guys in the store the workers in the store were saying that's not working that's 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 money for nothing that is and he just went oh thank you very much thank you very much write that down right and suddenly appears with this song and this was before mtv came out in europe yeah but mtv amazingly just came out at exactly the same time as as brothers in arms came out so it was it was another coincidence and steve baron who approached us to do this uh, video uh, which was computer graphics which hadn't really been done very much before cutting edge uh, too <laughs> yeah it was and it was a great and we we didn't really we weren't sort of convinced by it, to be honest. It just seemed a bit sort of cartoon. And he said, no, trust me, trust me. And we went, okay, we better ask the record company if they want to spend this money first. And nobody bothered. So we went and spent the money anyway. But, uh, and, you know, it was just one of those things. It just captures people's imagination. And, oh, I don't know. It's just, if, if we knew how to be successful all the time, there'd be an awful lot of people talking to you <laughs> talking to you every day about um, oh you just do this and you just do that and you know sometimes you just don't know and then cds of course came out at the same time so it was a it was a sort of magical moment of all this technology and all coming together at one time and yep. mtv suddenly went all over europe and then all over the world so and then we did the tour and oh you know the hey, i'm glad i'm glad i was there and i lived through it because those uh, i yeah. i just I just can't see the excitement now of, of searching YouTube for hours and hours to find one song I might like that I might go stream. I mean, I just, it doesn't yeah. seem as sexy for, for the lack of a better word, you know? Um, it was, there's so much of it. I think that one of the problems, I mean, okay, it's all great, this technology, but there's so much we're now finding ourselves having to deal with on a daily basis. I mean, I don't do Twitter and I don't do, somebody else does all that because I, I, I first of all I don't really know how to do it so it doesn't somebody else we have a relationship and we, she does that and that's fine 
and she says what do you want to put up and i said some of that some of that so i i don't really understand it but there is so much content coming at kids of a certain age now it's not surprising they don't know what where, where to go and what to do and for you and i we just go onto youtube and you get lost for about four days you know what i mean you just go, oh yeah. and they'll shove yeah. more stuff at you and so you, it's best not to go there actually it, it really is um my Let's life in dire straits straight. is available now um john absolute pleasure i've i've uh you know uh, that brothers in arms and that whole period in the 80s was was very marking to me of course uh and, and you worked with tommy mandel who played on brian adams stuff who of course canadian yeah. another big marking moment for me um anyway as we say here uh, merci beaucoup absolute pleasure um would uh, love to do a part pleasure. two at some time mon plaisir Merci bien. And uh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> a bientôt, folks, as they say. <laughs> uh, a bientôt, yes. Uh, and uh, yes, let's do this again. Thank you, sir. Okay, it's a pleasure. Nice to talk to you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.